Um, can you go into, as you said that you talk, um, mentioned several projects, can you go into detail into any of those? Uh, yeah, um, I'll be general because, you know, a lot of them are, are usually project or innovation stuff that we're doing. But some other key ones, we've got some big clinical studies that we're planning, like phase two, phase three, across some of our portfolio for dossier developments and uh, submissions. So I work with those teams um, for other projects, key initiatives, and I, I'm talking product initiatives that we would bring to the market in the future. Um, I run a global, what we call seamless technical organization where myself, my product supply leader, my regulatory leader, and then my development leader would sit on that team and we'd bring in various reviews that would happen on key projects so that we could keep the innovation going across many of our, our, our key projects uh, that we have ongoing upstream. As do, you, say, do you get the freedom to decide which projects to work on? And if so, how do you make those decisions? For the most part, I get the freedom. Uh, I kind of de decide for myself, again, which ones I think I can hopefully add some value to and or keep barriers out of the way and keep the project moving. And so I kind of pick and choose. Now, if it's been directed by my president who I report to, you know, there may be certain projects he says I need you to be working on. Uh, and so they'll assign me to certain things. Um, like certain categories, we're looking at different innovation spaces. He'll have me work on that with a team, or something like that. So it's a mix that I'll, I'll, I usually get to choose more often than not at this point in my career. Uh, but uh, there are things that you end up doing uh, because you've been asked to as well. So combination. So um, you have a lot of teams that you have to look over. Um, what are some ideal characteristics of individuals that are on your teams? Yeah, so this, you know, this, is, this one's always a, a fun one, I think. Um, you know, I think first I look, and again, I, I, I use my research and development lens. Uh, as far as characteristics for me, deep technical mastery, and that could be in any area that uh, is needed or the work we're doing. Um, I would say a, a unending curiosity to problem solve. Uh, so to find solutions or new ways to do stuff or bringing a, a unique technology uh, to the market. So look for that. Um, I, I think the other thing is, is, is working with smart people and finding the people that you believe um, are going to help you and you can help them. Uh, we'll get to that later. And, um, as, as we talk about other experiences, but, uh, you know, working with those people and aligning yourself with those people that you see that get work done, people you respect, that's, that's, that's critical. Um, it goes without saying, I'm sure you get told this as well in school, strong communication and collaboration skills is just critical uh, because if you're the smartest person in the world, but you can't communicate what needs to be done, et cetera, uh, it's not much help. Um, and then the last one, which I think is what I've always done is uh, one of my key things is have a strong bias towards action. So don't let things sit too long, figure out an action or something you wanna do to move it along. Um, I, I just think that uh, sometimes people wait too long or ignore things. And so you've got to be willing to act and it may always not may always not be the right in the end may not be the right one, but at least you took an action. Uh, for, for things. I think one of the best pieces of advice that my PI gave me when I first joined the lab was, or it wasn't advice, it was a statement he made. He's like, I can always buy more supplies. I can't buy more time. And so you may fail, but you got to go for it. Yep. Yeah, you, and we, we call it, I mean, it's, these are, you'll hear terms I'm probably using that you've heard. It's also, you know, smart risk taking, right? When do mm -hmm. you do stuff and, uh, um, you know, those, those are the sometimes if you look back on a career where you did something that you were like, well, maybe I'll just do it 
and see what happens that sometimes when those paid off, it, it, it either bonded you with something or you learned something or uh, I just think those are the things that make the difference sometimes. And then the classic fail, fail early. Fail early, I like fail early. Uh, I, I like not failing too fast if you're, you know, enough time to, to kick the tires as they say on stuff, mm -hmm. right? But agree with fail early and get out and make a decision. Um, I worry sometimes if people make decisions too fast, they don't let them think. Uh, you know, one of my experiences with a manager that I had, and I'm, I'll go off script a little bit, but uh, uh, you know, I've been in the company probably 12 years in P&G and I got this new director who was, ended up being terrific, but our first three months, she was new to the category. I was new to the category in the, in the company and she would send me 20 emails a day of questions. And finally, I had to give her a timeout and say, hey, I'm a thinker, I need time. I will get back to you, I promise. We will get this worked out. But it was, a, it was an expectation shift that I had to, to get in front. Otherwise, I would have not have been happy and probably would have left and looked for another job. But in the end, she ended up being one of my better managers at P&G later. Because uh, she trusted me, she, she got to respect me, and I respected her. But the start was not, was not good, it was tough. I think that's a perfect example of also your communication skills and ensuring that you got that done. Yeah. Um, this is going to go somewhat in hand with the ideal characteristics, but what has impressed you the most about the people that you work with? You know, I'm, I'm fortunate and, uh, you know, to work at Pete Procter and Gamble, we've got such a diverse group of people and, you know, just when I get tired one day or I'm fed up, I'll have an interaction with somebody that I'm just like, man, that was, I'm, I, you know, it just, it, it inspires you. So the people and the, uh, and just seeing the things that they can do. And I've learned so many different areas, not just in drug development and pharmaceuticals, being in a consumer health company, but you see the breadth of engineering, the breadth of product supply that, gets brought to the company that, that just delivers our cases, the, just the breadth of things you see across the, a company like ours, which is diverse, um, you learn to respect it. So it really is the people, and, and I can tell you our company lives and breathes that, that people is our number one asset. Um, what skills and experiences have prepared you the most for the current role you're in? You know, I wrote, uh, let me, I want to go to my notes because I wrote this down. There was a, as I look back, there was probably six or seven things across the many things that you could have done. The one move I did that got me crash course in industry drug development was my stint at Quintiles before I came to P&G. So as you said, I was at Texas Tech for a few years. And most of the people that graduated out of Pat's lab, Pat McNamara, I'm sure you all know who he is, um, had gone to industry, but I decided to take a detour uh, to Texas Tech with, uh, with David Allen, had recruited me there, who's now the dean at Mississippi, I think you guys know. Um, and, but I, I liked it, but I, I decided to look for an industry job, and a CRO, a contract research organization, couldn't have been a better place for me. I learned so much. I worked individual BE studies. I was on a project leader for a small biotech company. I was working AIDS development drugs with a small spinoff of Glaxo when we were doing studies in, in, uh, in Argentina. I mean, I just learned so much. It prepared me uh, for the thinking of, of industry drug development. Um, the second one, the second thing that I think helped me was taking the job with P&G Pharmaceuticals at the time. We had a pharmaceutical division, um, and that was really being, you know, focused with an individual company who was leading their own development, not just working with uh, a contract research company. Um, and that's where I got to meet a bunch of great people. I got to meet some people that were great mentors to me. Um, and then the third 
time I'd made a move was I left my function. If, if you knew my background, I was a clinical pharmacokineticist and pharmacologist by training. Um, I left that, uh, my function and went into a project leader develop, of overall development uh, for pharmaceuticals. So I was not only just doing the studies, I was working with phase three studies, the upstream studies, but I had a whole portfolio of projects across a certain category. That was critical for me to see all parts of the business. And then, um, unfortunately, uh, we divested pharmaceuticals from P&G in 2009. Um, and I was fortunate, they don't know, companies don't always ask people this, but they asked me if I would want to stay. Um, and I went on an interview tour internally and I interviewed with, we had a pet care division at the time and we had the OTC division, which I'm with. Um, I was actually gonna take the pet care job. I liked the director, he was excellent. Um, not that I didn't like the PHC person, but I just had a better felt connection. But they came to me and said, well, we're gonna, we need you to go to PHC. This was one of those things where I was kind of told we need you to do this versus the choice. Um, and that started my trajectory outside of RX development. I learned the OTC, uh, you know, pathways, the monograph system in the U.S., the supplement uh, pathway for products, uh, device, etc. So I got a crash course outside of Rx development, which for me uh, set me up for what I'm doing now. Um, and then during that time in PHC, I took different roles. I was doing a narrow row in our digestive division. Then I did our upstream uh, work, what we call front-end innovation. Then I took over IP management and then I did downstream. So that all prepared me for that. And then my move to Geneva, I was doing an international part, international work because we had a, a, a joint venture with Teva Pharmaceuticals for our international PhD division for eight years. Um, and so the people reported to me, but they didn't get direction from me. And so when we, we dissolved that joint venture and we acquired the Merck acquisition of the consumer health in Europe and the rest of the world. Um, I moved to Geneva to do that, and that gave me a whole new breadth of uh, experience. So I think those were the probably the six or seven big key moments for me that allowed me to grow and develop and, and get to where uh, I am today, uh, at least on my breadth of, uh, of knowledge across the categories. And, which of these transitions would you say was the hardest? Mm. And why? Yeah. Um, hardest was the move to Geneva. Because I left, we left, we, my wife and I, my, our, our only daughter's grown. Uh, we had our first grandkid while I was over here. We've had our second one since we've been here. We haven't been able to see them. Um, and so we, cha we changed our whole life uh, later in life. Uh, so it's, it's been hard. It's been very rewarding, but it was uh, the distance from family and friends and making new friends was good, but it was probably the hardest one. I, I always look back and go, what if I hadn't done that? But I don't think I would have gotten to my next uh, promotion if I hadn't done it because it gave me the full international experience to, to, to get that nod later. So with this last one, you had the geographic obstacle. Um, what were some other key obstacles in these turning points? And yeah. what prepared you the most for these obstacles? Yeah, I think um, the one, one that when I went from Rx to the consumer health side, which is, is very different. And this is this will sound, and this is me saying, this will sound a little uh, uh, snooty, if they will, but uh, Rx is easy. I know exactly what I need for registration for most bodies of health, boards of health. It's controlled clinical studies. It's phase one, two, three. I mean, I, I could do that. You can teach somebody how to do that. As soon as you go into all these other regulatory spaces where it's different across countries, regions, so the OTC space, the monograph system in the US does not 
It's not in the, in the other parts of the world. Uh, the supplement spaces, everybody's got different requirements on the levels of, of, of vitamins that are allowed or supplements that are allowed. Uh, EFSA has, you know, the European Food Supplements Authority. They have different regulations. It's just so much more complex um, that, but I enjoyed learning the more stuff, but it was an added level. And we had people, I would say, that embraced that change from the pharmaceutical that stayed. And we had some people that could never transition because they couldn't get the pharma mindset. I've got to do it this way, every way, everything from the way you develop stuff to the, the controls you use in manufacturing, et cetera. So um, it doesn't mean it's easier. It just means it's different and you got to think differently. So that was uh, one. Um, and then I think moving from, uh, uh, when I moved from uh, change bosses, like I said, that was another one that I had mid-career. Um, but I've been very fortunate to have, most all my bosses have been very supportive and I learned to work with them and you'll find that you start your careers, you're always gonna have, just when you think you've got it all worked out, you're gonna get moved or you're gonna get a new boss. So you might as well get used to working with different people. I mean, as they say, as soon as you're comfortable, it's time to move, right? Yeah, you know, that was hard for me. I, I was, I, I'll say this, and maybe that was what made my transition the harder one when I moved here. I was comfortable in my last, well, I had been in the role for five years. I'd been the director of North America. I had a new president that came, vice president that came in. We developed the innovation with our teams. I knew that person very well. I knew all the people. And so I loved my job and to, to totally change it. And even though I still now have those people back, it's still, you know, it's, it still was a big change, but I'm glad I did it in the end. I'll look back and um, I'm glad I did it, but you're right. It's uh, be careful when you start getting too comfortable in anything in life. <laughs> um, if you could go back and make one change, what would you make? It would probably be, although it, again, it, it was something that probably helped me mature, but I, I didn't take the same path. I worked five years in between my undergraduate and before I went to graduate school. So I was uh, set up a laboratory, I was clinical chemistry, I had a, a certification in med medical technology. So I set up a diabetes clinic uh, lab uh, for Kentucky Diabetes Foundation was the name of it. And then I came to work at the pharmaceutical, uh, the pharmacy school as a, as a research analyst. That's where I actually met Pat. I, he hired me as a technician um, at first. And so, and then I went to graduate school and then if I could have done something different, I would have loved to have been able to go through, you know, a progression, but I think that still helped me be get more mature and be focused because I wasn't the best student in undergraduate from a focus. I mean, I wasn't, if you looked at my GPA, I think I probably ended up with a two nine or a three composite in undergrad. I wasn't the star student, but I had it in me. I just, it was lack of focus. And so when I did it, but it took me, so when I started my career, I was already in my mid thirties and I was 30, you know, when I graduated, I was 32, 33. So I was like, I felt like I was behind. When I got to P&G, we had engineers that were two promotions ahead of me that started out straight out of school at 22. Uh, you know, they were already managers in their 30s and I was starting out as a scientist. So, but uh, again, I, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't change it, but that's one thing I look back on and go, man, I could have done that a little more streamlined. Uh, without the detour, but anyway. So I'm hedging on that one a little bit. Completely understandable. Um, what do you wish someone had told you prior to the completion of graduate school and your graduate training? Yeah, I had wrote that down. Let me go back. I want to make sure I have that. The thing for me, and you guys may get it, but because I knew I was going to be in drug development, I didn't understand the regulatory, 
how things got done regulatory wise uh, from a development standpoint. I knew the phases of work, I knew this, but when you talk about submissions, interactions with the Board of Health, how that gets done, that was something I didn't know and until I went to Quintiles and, and learned more on that side, even though I was doing upstream development. Then when I got to p and I got a crash course with our regulatory folks. And that was one person I found that was a senior person that I said, I wanna, I'm gonna learn from this person. Um, it was really that regulatory piece and all that stuff you've got to maneuver in addition to doing great science and innovation, you got to know how to bring it to market or bring it through the university. It's those kind of things that uh, um, are the tangibles that uh, can make it be successful that I wished I knew, appreciated more than knew. And I don't know, maybe you guys are getting that now, but it's something that I wish I'd have had earlier. I think we cover it in like our intro to farm side classes. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's a very general overview. And like we know, as you said, we know the phases, but the intricacies of the process are really not, um, they're really not focused on right now. Yeah, yeah. So for me, at least for now. Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat that? I missed it. No, I said, I said, yeah, I didn't, I thought I heard somebody say something. I didn't, I said, this, was there a question? It sounded like, but maybe it's just some background noise. Um, how have you seen the field evolve in your time and how has it stayed constant? Well, so a couple of things happened during my time, which was interesting. When I graduated, I don't know if you get, you know, it was 24 years ago now, um Clinton had just taken was in the middle of office and was talking healthcare reform. The jobs dried up. Industry went went silent, radio silence. There were a few jobs, but they all got nervous that the hammer was coming down on, you know, government health care, they're gonna control the industry, etc. Um, and so jobs got a little uh, tight back then before when I was going through school, people were getting five, six offers at a time. That wasn't the case when I came out. Um, and then over time, you've seen, I think, pharmaceutical companies consolidate. And again, I'm gonna talk drug industry and development. And what you've seen is biotech companies explode. You've seen smaller companies uh, become competitors. You see, um, I think a lot of CRO type organizations trying to get different niches through the organization. Pharma started farming out a lot of work like clinical development and other things. So that's the evolution I've seen over my time is that um, you no longer have these humongous pharmaceutical organizations across 10 different categories. They've gotten very focused in areas and gotten rid of the ones they, they didn't think were Money making, so I think they've got. I think they've shrunk in the magnitude of work they do. But it's the good thing is that's gone to other smaller, different companies, consumer health companies, like ours are doing different work, uh, etc. So that's that's what I've seen more. You you just don't see as many jobs across the industry uh, traditionally as as was when when it was first. I don't know what it is for you guys, but uh, maybe you see more. But I think you'll find them in very different spots these days, or you know, across. How do you see COVID and our upcoming economic crisis playing into this? I think there's going to be a lot of companies hurting, and I think some are going to do very well. Um, the jury's still out for we're, we we. We, we've done okay, we've done well because our products, we have a very diverse portfolio as, as you may or may not know across cleaning products to <laughs> consumer products to products that people want and need. Um, so that's a good thing. But, you know, if there's so much economic downturn, people are gonna constrict and not buy as much. I mean, there's a lot of factors at play here. I think in healthcare though, it's it's, it's probably re-energized the healthcare industry uh, that what a role that we and you all will play in the future. So from that standpoint, I think it's a positive. 
um, with all the other negatives that have come with the, you know, the, the catastrophic nature of many of the things. But I think from a health standpoint and healthcare consumer pharmaceutical companies, now is the time for us to show and be leaders uh, in the industry. And I hope that's what happens to some of these big pharmaceutical companies. I hope they get their, uh, their mojo back, if you ask me, uh, from a, just the standing and credibility and, and people thinking they're good, not just that they cost a lot of money on their medicines, as you all probably hear. <laughs> I've been told several times I sell my soul to pharma, but at this point, I don't have any left, apparently. Well, you know, it's industry, it always, it depends, you know, it's always where you are in the journey too, right? My father was a, a hospital administrator for 30 something years at, at our, the rural hospital that was the town I grew up in. And he was a staunch proponent of healthcare. And boy, once he retired, he wanted everything at cost. And so <laughs> we still have discussions now. I'm like, dad, do you not remember? If you don't invest in innovation, you will not have new products that cure people, et cetera, et cetera. So now we have these discussions because you know, he's got retired. So it does depend on where you're, you're, you come from, but um, I, I believe in innovation so strongly. If you don't innovate, you won't last and, and you won't keep uh, developing new products and medicines for people. Um, with with the involvement of the field over time and then the new COVID and economic crisis, um, what's a unique challenge that you see for the current graduate students and how do you think we can prepare for this? How could we adjust our training to match the demand? Well, one, I think you're gonna need to get comfortable with virtual uh, even more because we're even doing, I mean, I know that you know, when they're trying to bring people in our plants, they're having to do in, uh, virtual interviews with people now. Our internship we're running this summer, we're gonna run it and they're doing it virtually. So as much as they wanna bring people in, they're gonna try to do their best. And I think they're still gonna have, as we're opening our labs back up now, we're in the process beyond just essential workers. Um, but they've already, our, our IT teams and stuff have been working hard to try to give the students the best uh, um, experience they can. So I just think being agile and being able to adjust and uh, you know, we're gonna be in this. We've learned in our organizations, a lot of people, especially the people that don't do lab-based work like regulatory and others, we're, we're finding some people say they're more efficient than they've been um, in the past because they don't have a one and a half hour commute, et cetera. But then you got on the other side, people saying, well, I'm not as efficient because I got family I'm taking care of when I'm home and it's not as easy for me. So uh, I think just being flexible with that and uh, and then just, you're gonna have to, the way the benefits and make sure you look at these companies that you join or academic institutions you join to make sure you think they're, they're, they're good for at least the near term we're going to see what that what happens. I mean, you're seeing, you know, some of the industry um, get hurt real bad. I mean, airlines is an easy one, but still, it's, there's going to be consolidation across certain industries. Speaking of work life, how has your work life balance evolved throughout your career? I kind of chuckled when I saw that question as I was writing the answer. It's gotten worse. <laughs> uh, um, I yearn for the days, well, I shouldn't say, but it has gotten worse, but um, I loved it when I was just doing clinical pharmacokinetics on a project. I mean, it was the best, I, I had the best time doing that at P&G, at Quintiles and other things. But I loved doing all the other stuff, but that were, there was a calmness in being a master of what you do, right? Um, but for me, what's helped me is I've just learned to intermingle my personal and work. It's just the way I, I cope with it. You know, a lot of people have carry around three different phones. I carry around one phone. I, I combine my business and personal. Um, I mean, the company allows us to do that, providing you don't do certain things on your phone. Uh, uh, but for me, that's my sanity. If I was doing that and, and juggling three different numbers, and et cetera, 
And then the other thing that's helped me is you got to find what gives you peace outside of work. For me, it's exercise. Uh, I try to do that daily for 45 minutes to an hour whenever I can, um, five to six days a week. That's my peace. That's my calm. That's my time. Um, so it's just finding that ways. And I have some days that are better than others. Um, and, you know, it's a choice. Some, it's, it's the choice of, you know, putting in more time or not putting in more time. And you don't always have to put in more time. You got to be smart about it. Uh, but uh, I'd be lying if I said I have a great balance at this point. Uh, I have to work at it to, to do that. And luckily I have, I can just tell my, my folks or my, my assistant to help me. I need help today, block some stuff out. Um, it's from Yulia. How has working across different time zones played into this balance or lack of balance? Well, it's shown me I don't want to go, I don't want to work out of Asia uh, because they, I'll be honest, they have the worst schedules because they, and I know this because of my team, right? So they're up late at night because they're dealing with the U.S. if they have to. They're up early to get their work done in the region. It's just the worst. I think Europe, at least I can do a balance because uh, in the middle of the time zones, and then the U.S., for us, because that's our headquarters, they kind of get to, they're kind of, they have more of the operation kind of leadership there, so they can kind of make their own time. So uh, um, I think you just choose. You have to be uh, flexible. Like when I was in the U.S., I would alternate with my Asia leader. we do it in the morning my time one month, and i do it at night my time, so that I mixed it up for them. And then you find out what's comfortable for people. Some people prefer it. They don't mind it being outside at normal business hours. And then you, you figure out what works for people. But uh, uh, it, it, is, it, is, it does add to the complexity or the layer of, of juggle you have to do when you're across multiple regions. Yeah, I always have to double confirm time zones. Always have to double confirm. And I, at least on our calendar, my calendar, I keep... I know which time zone because you can put the different time zones in so you can see where it's lining up so I know automatically when I see it what time it is there and then of course once you've been doing it for so long I know oh gosh it's it's 11 o'clock their time they're coming in on a meeting it's just you know I'm usually in bed by 10. Um, so I personally am uh, super interested in advocacy and even if it's not like a centric career, uh, I, I definitely need to have some sort of tangential opportunities to engage with outreach and advocacy. Have you had many opportunities um, to partake in these activities, I guess, endeavors? Yeah, I mean, well, P&G has a really strong, and I'll talk the company piece and then we can talk the personal piece. I mean, P&G has a, within our company, a long history of groups and organizations that do a lot of stuff with outreach. And I think COVID-19 is another example. I could go down a, a list of things that we do, that the company has been doing from donations to making things in our plants that we never made before, from mass to, to to, to hand sanitizers, to other things. Um, um, but then there's also other ways to connect in the outreach. And when, you know, when I was in the U.S., we worked with, 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 with local harvest and food banks and things there that we could do. And they would allow us to donate a day of our time to go do that. We do, we do events with our, our leadership teams to go do that together. We didn't make it mandatory because, again, it's a, it's a volunteer thing. Um, so yeah, I think those are those are are, are definitely available. Um, my time personally is is has been uh, has been constricted for me. Um, but you all may or may not know my my conviction was setting up a fellowship at the University of Kentucky uh, School of Pharmacy, which I did. I really wanted to do that. I had that was kind of my way of of. of, of helping pay back to the university what they've given me. Um, 
and I try to do some other things like that uh, throughout the things we do um, with my wife and I. Um, as a matter of fact, we just, one of our friends, they have, uh, we just got, uh, she showed me another one that we did that we just started helping was a, a small startup of young high school students that were um, giving femcare products to females in their community who couldn't afford it. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a impressive, and they have a TED talk that they did. And, um, and so it's those kind of things that inspire me to try to, to help and do those things. So I think it's, it's important. That's awesome. What's a question I should be asking you that I am not? What's the question you should ask me that I am not? Let me see, let me look at my notes and see what else I wrote. You know, one thing that I, I, um, I've given a talk on it in, in, internally, and I took a training at Northwestern um, when I got at a certain level, that's the one thing we do. We try to do external trainings with at different levels that you make in the company. Um, but I can't stress networking enough. And I don't just mean connecting on uh, LinkedIn. Yes, that's important. But um, it's, it's, it's truly about the network and the trust you build with some key people in your career, in your life, where you are at school. Um, I can tell you right now, when I have a problem I need working on, even internally, I probably got five people I know I'm gonna call that I've worked with and I trust and I say, I need you to look at this. And I have other people, don't get me wrong, but how do you build the network? Don't always look at that and um, there's a uh, there's a good uh, there's an analogy of um, uh, Paul Revere if you know the history of the Boston Tea Party so the reason why Paul Revere had rallying he went door to door and like was telling people and people he had already knew the community and they knew that something do something there was another person that went the other way that doesn't get told in the story that was not connected, that didn't do anything. And that person had, didn't get any people behind the cause. So it just shows you the network. It's, it was part of that training. And this, this professor at Northwestern just made it so important of how you should be able to go through through your career. And he makes you do an exercise is who influenced you write their name down, and who, what connections did they make for you that you now have made, and then write those people down, and then what connections, and you'll find out who, I forget the term, but who were your key connectors throughout your career? Those are the ones that you should be thanking and making sure you continue to work with because they're the connectors that have helped you make things get done, and you vice versa. So networking, I think, is, uh, is a key one, but there's a there's a deliberate way you should think about it and do it, and not just oh I've met somebody, but you got to build the relationships too. Sorry that was long winded, but uh, no. Have um, you by chance read The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell? I have not read that one. It's it. I I think that's where like the Paul Revere and the Rosa Parks story mm -hmm. comes in, and how to create movements. Um, yep. Yeah, he goes over the Paul Revere story and the oh, reason right. that he was able to be successful and the other guy wasn't. Yep, yep. No, it's a it's a classic. It it, it helped to come to life for me when I heard it. You know, even mid career, um, uh, and then we had other examples. But uh, anyway, I do think that's important. And then the other one is I, I touched on it was was finding good mentors. Uh, mm -hmm at the company you go to work, at the school you were. I mean, I like I said, when I came to PNG, there were three or four people I, I aligned myself with. There was a senior technical, we call them T's, they're technical discipline mastery people, that I just clicked with and I said, you know what, I'm gonna review everything with this, this person. And he built a trust, I built a trust with him that I just learned so much. And to this day, we're friends, he's retired. 
Um, another gentleman, I, re I said, a regulatory uh, person that I, I came early on, I said, how can I help you? I wanted to do, I got to do some projects with him and he became a great mentor and now one of my best friends and he's retired from the company. Um, so, but I, it's those people that will help you in your career. And then they helped my career because they could vouch for me. And, you know, when I came up for promotions, they were, I'm sure the first ones that were saying my name, um, but that was because I had proven myself with them and trusted them. But find those mentors uh, and the people that you, you, you work closely with and can learn from. Other yeah. than like establishing that trust, what advice do you have for cultivating mentor-mentee relationships? And what are some common mistakes you see people make? Yeah, I think one is if you just don't click personality wise or, you know, don't force it. I, they, they, when I came to Procter and Gamble, they automatically give you a mentor. It's just, they, they do, they gave me somebody, me and this person did not click at all. We met twice and that was it. And I was like, why did I, why did I need that? So first is don't, waste your time if you both don't feel comfortable and you know just that's just the way it's going to be sometimes um and then the other is find a common bond why because i think that that helps strengthen the discussion and, and what you're doing so at least that's one reason and then somebody outside your discipline or field that can make you think differently and give you a different perspective that's also very good uh, to have uh, people that you can look to that are either outside of your uh, function, you know, your core function that you're working in or organization, because that brings new different thinking to it. So a couple of those different things, I would say. I might not have answered that question completely, but, uh, um, but yeah, and then be deliberate about it. Come prepared. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? And, uh, and what can they help you with if you, is your meeting with people? That was definitely a solid answer. Thank you. Um, there's a question from the audience, uh, slightly specific, but when you did clinical pharmacology and pharmacokinetics, what kind of specific software did you use the most and thought was most useful? <laughs> well, we, these are old, right? So they, they've developed, right? We've gone on, but we were using um, you know, some of the older PK software and Win Nonlin and others that we used back in the day when I was working. Um, and then we were using code. I had some great analysts when I came to PNG that we could, he would write code for our, for our modeling stuff. I mean, just, I was fortunate. I wasn't a code writer back then. Um, and I learned some with them. So that's just another example how somebody with a different skill set and you can come together. I knew the, I knew the, you know, all the mechanics and the equations and all that in the biology, et cetera, bring it together. But this guy knew the code and knew how all the stuff could get wrote. And we did modeling for lots of different things that we were doing. Um, so it was a combination and, um, you know, there's a lot of, I know, new development now that, um, we use a lot more stat software now in the work that, that we do um, that they use uh, with Jump and other things that, that we use within the company. So it's a, it's a wide variety of stuff where you, you know, there's all kinds of um, AI software now with, that our statisticians are using to model and do different things from Python to, I could name enough that I'm dangerous that they're the experts uh, but it's I know it's come a long way so are there any other questions from the audience well I'm going to thank you again for your time Dr. Bergio really appreciate it if you could hang on for one more second um, while we let everybody else leave that could be great <laughs> Sure, thank you all. Good luck. Bye, Joseph.
Um, do, you, do you have any recommendations of how I could be better with this? I mean, I thought the, the, the questions were helpful for me to get some framing and thinking. And then, you know, it was, it was fun from my perspective. I mean, I think you have to let it go a little free flowing, right? Because yeah. that's how you, if it's too structured, I think uh, you lose a bit of the spontaneity of some things that may spark to people or not. Uh, um, so I think that that's always a, a good thing to, to leave some some openness for that um, and it sounded like people were submitting their questions to you via chat so you could get their questions because that had been the only other thing I could say is people could ask their own questions but you moderating is just as good as because of the sound and quality so uh, yeah from that perspective and then you know if there's any other things in the questions you want to kind of learn you, you could maybe ask people to pre-submit you know, the answers to the questions, that way you could really focus on some other stuff, but. Okay. What about uh, you, Was that, did that meet your needs or you guys' needs? On definitely, definitely, 100%. No, you were, you were fantastic. Um, is it possible for me to get your CV just to see like what an industry CV looks like um, and share that with the rest of the graduate students? Yeah, I can. I can tell you it's going to be, it's very industry PNG focused. I haven't submitted a CV. I mean, I kind of keep it up to date. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I could, I could, I could share it with you. I'd, 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 I'd like you not to be sharing it across outside, of course, but I could do that. I, I could find one, the last one I put, the last one I updated. <laughs> I probably need to update it again. It's probably been a nine months since I've done anything to it or a year. Well, I really appreciate that. Yep. Um, is there any, do you have anything else for me? No, no, just thank you. Best of luck and uh, hopefully everything goes well uh, there and uh, everybody gets through school. When do you graduate? Um, I'm, in my, I'm in my third year right now, so anticipating two more years. Um, I just submitted a F31 application, which hopefully I'll hear back on in September. And if that gets funded, then it'll probably for sure be two years from there. But we'll see. COVID mm -hmm. probably will prolong that timeline for sure. We have like there's there's some experiments that are continuing from before this, but we've been told to halt any new experiments. Um, so even like productivity has just been all time low. So yeah, we we've had to do the same thing. We had to do only essential work, and we like you guys in the university, we had to develop protocols for how we would bring people in, etc. So. We're starting to open it up, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's taking a toll on the, the lab work, and mm -hmm. you know our plants had to go through a whole redo on stuff to make sure that they were com you know, keeping people safe. And uh, so yeah, so well, good luck, and hopefully you'll get back on track soon. Uh, Thank you. Yep, yeah, very good. Anything else? That's it. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I really, really do appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Take care. Bye.